This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Okay, Bruchem Abom, welcome everyone. Parshas Chai Yisara. We uh, welcome everyone to tonight's uh, edition of the weekly Parsha Shir. Uh, we're going to do something a little different uh, this week. Usually the Shirim are on the Parshas Shavua, but we're going to take the liberty this week. Parshas Chai Yisara is uh, the first Zivug that we have in the Chumash. And it's a good opportunity to talk about marriage. In fact, Rav Pam, who gave his weekly Chumash year on Fridays, he would always utilize uh, Erev Shabbos, Parshas Chayisara, to talk about Shiduchim and marriage. So we'll uh, follow in the footsteps of G'day Yisrael. And we're going to utilize uh, tonight's year to speak about marriage. Um, what I'm going to tell you tonight are not my own ideas, they're not my own Chidushim. This comes from a famous shir, if not the most famous shir, of Harav Avigdor Miller, Zechazak Levracha. I had this chus when I came back from Eretz Yisrael. Maybe it was um, 2005. Yeah. So I had the yeah. privilege to uh, go hear shir from Avigdor Miller for about three years until, uh, until his patira. Uh, Rav Miller was uh, vibrant and energetic and alive, really, until his mm-hmm. last day. And I remember personally, um, mm-hmm. I remember walking to his shul at the Soif Yamav and uh, discovering that, unfortunately, he was not well enough to give the shir. This was maybe two weeks before his patira. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember that bitter day um, well, that when Rav Miller passed away. And uh, it, was, it was a big loss for me personally and for all of Klal Yisrael. So we're going to speak now about the, uh, the famous shir that Rav Miller gave. It's called the Ten Commandments of Marriage. Now why do we say Ten Commandments of Marriage? What do commandments have to do with marriage? Everybody knows when Hashem gave us the Torah, He gave us Asaras Hadebrais. Well, the Gemara says in Masech Saita, Ish ve'isha shalom b'neim shechina b'neim. That a, a man and a woman, if there's zoycha to have peace between them, the shechina resides among them. Which means, which is good news, because if the shechina rests in the home when there's shalom, the good news is that on the onset of the marriage, when the chassan says to the kala under the chuppah, he says the magic words, you know, Hareyat mikudesh asli. Well, at least we know for that split second there was shalom then. That's one thing we know. You know, when he's looking her in the eye, in that, that magical moment, there was peace at that moment. So one thing we know is the Shechina was present when the Chasson says to the Kala, Hare at Mikudeshes Li. That means at the moment of marriage, there were three partners there. There was the husband, the wife, and the Rebbeinu Shalalam. And what we have to understand is that declaration was not only applicable to that moment of Kiddushin, but the goal is we want to keep it a sanctified relationship throughout our lives. Now, in the Torah viewpoint, the highest status of uh, sanctification is a person can live a married life, the Kedusha. And therefore, an Oyved Hashem has to realize that a very important part of Avodah Hashem, yes, learning, davening, but proper relationship, is a central, basic, fundamental aspect of Avodas Hashem. <clears throat> so that being the case, it's incumbent upon all of us to, to work our hardest to preserve the Kedusha, to preserve the, uh, the uh, sanctification in our homes and in our marriage. Well, if, if, if we uh, use this train of thought, we could compare then marriage to Kabbalah Satayra. And just like when God gave us the Torah, He gave us 613 mitzvahs, but He gave us Aseras Hadibrois, and Rav Saad Yagoyin explains that Aseris Hadibras were ten fundamental principles that encapsulate Kala Torah Kula. These are not just ten specific commandments, but these are generalities. They are the umbrella principles of all 613 uh, mitzvahs. So too, using this paradigm and using this model, maybe we could uh, boil down the rules and the guidelines of marriage likewise to ten fundamental principles. Certainly, they, are, they do not preclude other ideas and other principles. But the same way the Torah could be boiled down into ten generalities, perhaps then, Rav Miller says, we could, uh, we could sum up marriage into ten general concepts. And uh, maybe some of uh, these ideas will, will sound surprising to you. 
They may not be in vogue or in style in a contemporary America, but if you're a Chacham and you uh, want to take the advice of one of the great Gedele Yisrael and the advice of Das Torah, one would be very smart to pay careful attention to these ten principles. And if one is able to follow them and live by them, then Ashrecha V'toivlach, it will be good for you in this world and it will be good for you Ba'olam Haba. Okay, Marav Rabbi Yisai. Principle number one, the first commandment of marriage, the first commandment is be realistic. Be realistic. Mitsuosi. Be realistic. Do not, do not anticipate that marriage is a glorious career of endless enjoyment. If you have a fantasy that your marriage will be endless fun, happiness, sensation, glorious, glamorous, then you're in for a rude awakening. Do not have big expectations. The first principle of marriage is be realistic. Realize that marriage is exactly like life. What is life? Life is like driving on the highway. Some highways are smooth. Some highways are comfortable. Some highways get you from point A to point B quickly, painlessly. And then there's driving on the Van Wick. It's bumpy. It's painful, there's traffic, you're going to have uh, flat tires, there are going to be nails in the tires. Dr- um, marriage is like life. Some days are good, they're happy, things are going well, you're in a good mood, you're getting along well, and other days are miserable, other days are terrible, other days are painful. These are the realities of life. Don't expect more than that. Marriage is just a mirror of life. And if somebody has false anticipation that marriage is the elixir of all problems that's going to solve all your difficulties and all of your challenges, then you're in, you're in for a rude awakening. Some days are you going to reach the heights of success, and some days you're going to fall into depression. It is exactly like life. And don't expect anything more. Expect very little. Rev. Miller says... So why? you got to do it, that's why. <laughs> Rav Miller explains. Rav Miller explains as follows. What is life? Life is a series of challenges, tests. Every moment of life, every circumstance in life, every encounter in life, every relationship, every person, your boss, your worker, your garbage man, your fireman, your mailman, these, all of the encounters you have throughout the day, the people you work with, your father, your mother, your sister, your brother, your wife, your children, they are in this world for one purpose only, to test you. How do you interact with good people? How do you interact with difficult people? How do you interact with annoying people? How do you interact with people who like you? How do you interact with people that don't like you? Every interaction that you have in this world was prepared beforehand by the Rebbe Shalom as a test. And if you think, you know what, I haven't had any tests lately, then either you're not breathing or you're completely missing the boat. Every moment of life, non-stop, there are no breaks, there are no, there's no bein hazmanim, there's no bein hashois. Every moment of life is a series of challenges to a person. How will we react to the various aspects of life? When a fire truck passes by, it's a test. What's the test? You should think that if it's a Yid, I hope the Rebbe Shalom helps them. I hope the Rebbe Shalom saves them. You let the fire truck go by without thinking anything, you lost an opportunity. How do you interact with other Jews? What, what's your attitude to other Jews? What's your attitude to Rabbanim? What's your attitude to G'dayla Yisrael? What's your attitude to people who are learning? Each one of these series of, of um, phenomenon is a test for a person. And the biggest test in life is one's wife. How do you interact with her? That will ultimately decide to a very large extent what your afterlife, what your Olam Habo will look like. Says Rav Miller, let me give you an example. Here's a guy. He marries a woman. She takes care of the home. She takes care of the children. She does what she has to do. But he's not satisfied. He wanted to marry some kind of glamorous, sensational wife. And he's, he's discouraged. He feels bad. He feels, you know, maybe he's settled. 
and his mother's egging him on. You see, I told you, I told you you could have done better. I, you know, you married beneath your dignity. And finally, slowly, slowly, the words of the mother start to, you know, enter his mind and say, you know, maybe Taka, I made a mistake. What happened to Miller? The guy gave his wife, wife a get. What did he do to her? He killed her. He destroyed her life. He married a woman. She's faithful to him. She could have built up his house, could have had children. You know why he destroyed her and he destroyed his own life? For one simple reason. Unreasonable expectations. He thought that marriage is happiness and bliss. And he didn't realize that marriage is no different than life. It has good days, it has bad days. It has good times and it has bad times. And therefore, the biggest destructive force in marriage is unreasonable, fantastical expectations. Says Rav Miller, what does he think? His second wife is going to be any better? He doesn't realize that the second time around, he's not going to get someone half as good as his first wife. He has, he's delusional. He thinks maybe he'll try again, he'll get something better. Like haya for like nivra, it never will be. Says Rav Miller, of course, you got to look before you leap. You do your investigation, you do your drish of chakira, you try to investigate as best as you can. As they say, look before you leap. But... If you leapt first, if you took the leap and you didn't look, then you're stuck, you got to make the best of it. And the first objective in life is be realistic. Whatever the Yibbam Shem sent your way, your Makabel, and you say, this, is, this will be my success, Ad Me'ave Esrim Shana. Here's the story, says R. Miller. This woman marries a guy, they told her, you know, he's uh, the smartest guy in Lakewood. <coughs> Turns out the guy's, you know, a little slow. Turns out she could calculate the uh, grocery bills faster than uh, he can. And uh, what does she have to do? Don't be discouraged. Don't sweat it. Don't worry it. This is who the Rebbein Shalom sent you. You can have a happy life together. Don't have unreasonable expectations. Here you have a guy. Miller talks about the classic case. You have the yeshiva guy. And he's looking, and he's looking, and he's looking for the perfect girl. And he's 21, and he's 22, and he's 23, and he's 24, and he hasn't met the perfect girl yet. And he's 29, and he's 35, and he's 40. And then he realizes, he wakes up, he's 45, ah! And who does he marry? Everybody's looking. Who's going to be this Miss America that the guy ended up marrying after searching and searching and searching? I remember the words that Miller used. He married... He used this archaic expression. I don't even think people know what this means anymore. He married a superannuated girl. That means very old. Heavy-faced. I don't think we even use that expression anymore. He didn't get a metziah, to put it least. Why? He had unreasonable expectations. And in the end of the day, what was he waiting for? What was he hoping for? So, Marver Aboisai, <coughs> you get married... The girl is Shamatara Mitzvah, she's responsible, she takes care of the home, she takes care of your children. This is a matanam and Shamayim. Don't be unrealistic, make the best of it. And that is klal number one. The most important klal in marriage is be realistic. Don't have high expectations. Okay, that is number one. Marvar Aboisai, the second commandment of marriage. Second commandment of marriage is like this. And you're going to say, this sounds far-fetched. Nobody does this. You know, not in Jewish homes. So, don't be delusional. The second commandment of marriage is, and I see there are a lot of Bachram here. It's okay, you need to hear this. It's never too early to, to prepare yourself. The second commandment of marriage is, never break the routine of marriage. Which means like this. Yes, be realistic. But the end of the day is, there are going to be disagreements, and there are going to be bumps in the road, and there are going to be bad days, and there are going to be times where you don't want to talk to each other, you don't want to look at each other. Don't break the routine of marriage. Don't say, that's it. I'm not coming home for supper tonight. Don't make me supper. I'm going to go to, I'm going to eat at the shear. Wife says, but there's nothing left when you get there anyway. <coughs> no, I'm going to eat at the shear. I'm, not, I'm, gonna eat, I'm going to Carlos and Gabby's tonight. I'm not eating supper at home. I don't even bother. Don't break the routine of marriage. You sit down at the table. You don't have to say a word. 
Don't talk to her. You don't want to talk to her? Don't talk to her. You sit down at the table and you eat supper. You sit down on the table, you eat breakfast. I need money. You don't want to give her money. You're angry, upset. You don't even have to look at her. You open up your wallet. You need $500. I need to buy the kid's shoes. Don't say you bought last week already. No, you hand over the money. All the routine of marriage has to continue. Never stop the routine. Likewise, she's not in the mood of making supper. But Miller says, no, she's going to stand at that gas range like the Koyen and the Beis HaMikdash making the carbon Tomich on Shachar and the carbon mm-hmm. Tomich on about. She doesn't have to say, here is a wonderful supper for my wonderful husband. She doesn't have to say anything. She just puts the food down at the table. None of the routines of marriage should ever be broken. You're angry, you want to wring each other's neck, or worse, don't break the routine of marriage. Never should a woman refuse to go to the mikvah. Never should the man stop any of his regular responsibilities as a husband. Nothing should be broken. Because ultimately, through the routine of marriage, things will come back together again. But the moment you say, you, you're, you're so angry, you want to run away, you go to the airport. And you have a flight. Don't get on the airplane. Don't get on that airplane. The moment you get on the airplane... It could be bad news. You could come back, you know, an hour later, two hours later, five hours. Where were you? You don't have to say where you were. It only costs $25 to get back from the airport. Don't say where you were. Don't say what you're thinking of doing. Get back into the house. Never lock the door. Don't lock anybody out. Don't kick anybody out. Don't send her to your mother. Tonight you're going to your mother's house. You go to your mother's house tonight. Never break the routine of marriage, no matter how angry you are, no matter how upset. And you're, you're laughing, you say, this doesn't happen. Yeah. So either you're delusional or uh, Baruch Hashem. But this is, these are the realities. You could be angry, you could be upset. Just do the regular routine. You don't have to want to, you don't have to be happy about it, you don't have to smile. You could scowl, you can make the dirtiest, nastiest face in the world. Keep on the routine of marriage. That is commandment number two. Again, these are not my suggestions. These are not my ideas. This is a famous shir of Rav Victor Miller's Echel Sag Bracha, and I think we would be very wise to take this advice to heart. That is uh, commandment number two. Marabar Isai, commandment number three. The third commandment of marriages. Okay, so you got into a fight. Make up as soon as possible even if it's not your fault. Even if it's not your fault. It's her fault. You say you're sorry. Right? When every married person has to make the following decision. Do you want to be right? Or do you want to be happy? It doesn't matter whose fault it is. Because it says in Mishle, Poiter mayim reishis madain. You know what a fight is like? A fight is like water coming out of a dam. If you, ever, if you have a dam that's uh, sealing up the river... So if there's a little drop of water about to come through a crack, so you say, oh, it's not a big deal, nothing's going to happen, it's just a little moisture. But you have to realize, once the water starts to seep through, then slowly it's going to trickle through, and then there's going to be a rush of water, there's going to be a torrent of water, and before you know it, the whole dam is coming down, the whole city could be washed away. It's the same thing with a quarrel. A word was said, you're upset at her, she's upset at you. So you think it's not a big deal, you know, nobody has to apologize, nobody has to make the peace. No, you have to realize that there's a crack in the foundation right now, and the water is seeping through. And what a person needs to do is, if you're a smart man, if she's a smart woman, you make up as soon as possible. There are going to be difficulties, there's going to be quarrels, there's going to be challenges. A smart person, a chacham, tries to correct it as soon as possible. Don't drop the plate in the first place, but if you drop the plate, try to put it back together as soon as possible. Because if you let it linger, and you let it fester, then it takes on a a mind of its own, and it grows, and it builds off of each other, um, and it avalanches, and it could be trouble. So here you have a guy. He did something bad to his wife. I'm not even going to say what, because uh, for certain reasons. So now he's in big trouble. So what does he do? Go to Manhattan, go to the jewelry store. Yeah, well, it's going to cost you $8,000. You buy the diamond ring. She doesn't want to look at you. She doesn't want to talk to you. You hand her the diamond. 
My guess is she'll take it. That's, you have to do what you got to do. You got to make up as soon as possible. Don't let things fester. Don't let things linger. That is commandment number three. That if there's a fight, if there's a challenge, if there's a difficulty, you try to correct it as soon as possible. It's very hot over here. Is yeah. It, huh? yeah? Okay, turn it off. <laughs> Marvah Commandment number four. There is a word in marriage. It's a dirty word. You can never say it. It's apikarsos. It cannot be part of the lexicon. It cannot be in the vernacular. And that is, you can never say, I want to get... It's off limits. It's not in the possibility. It cannot ever be said. The moment you say the words, really? So you don't like it? So get rid of me. Divorce me. You know, you, know, you do that again, I'm going to divorce you. You can never, ever, ever say that. It cannot be part of the lexicon. You've got to take it out of the dictionary, cut it out. It's Osir Midairaisa Bechol Ashara Shabaylam. You can never, ever say those words under any circumstances. It cannot be in the realm of possibility. There's no such thing. There's no such thing. The moment you say the word get, then the magic of Harayat Mekodesh Asli, it's not the same anymore. Even if you don't mean it, even if it's in a moment of rage, even if it's a moment of anger, it's mamish a chet to say the words, okay, then we're going to get a get. Can never ever be said. Don't even think it. When you said those words, when you stood under the chuppah, and the, to the chas and kala are like in dreamland, and they thought life would be bliss, there's a certain magic at that moment. That magic is destroyed the moment you say the word get. It's not part of the lexicon, it's not part of the vernacular. You have as angry as you get. If you need to go, go out into outside, bang your head against the wall 70 times. Never say the words, that I'm going to give you a get. You know, whatever you need to do, turn on the bath, put your head under the water, whatever you gargle with salt water, punch a punching bag, take your teddy bear, rip it up, whatever you got to do. Don't ever say the words, then I'm going to give you a get. The moment you say those words, the, the magic has been uh, broken. That is commandment number four. Commandment number five of the Ten Commandments of Marriage is be loyal. Now let me explain to you. Marriage has nothing to do with romance. It has nothing to do with love. It is about one word, loyalty. It says in the Torah, al Kain Yazavish es aviv ve'esimai, Vidavak ishtai, cling to your wife. What does it mean to cling to your wife? <coughs> Where else in Tanakh does it say Vidavak? It says that when Naomi was going back to Eretz Yisrael with uh, Arpa and Rus, so what did Arpa do? Arpa kissed her, Arpa embraced her, but at the end of the day, Arpa dumped her and she went back. So kisses and hugs are meaningless. But what does it say about Rus? The Rus Dovkaba. Rus didn't hug her. Rus didn't kiss her. Rus was just loyal to her. The foundation of marriage is loyalty. Loyalty means you have to feel that you are responsible for the happiness and the welfare of your spouse. Which means you are ready to jump through fire and water to help her, for her to help him. And they have to be very loyal to each other. Sometimes in the family... Somebody's going to make a joke. Oh, Sprincy. Yeah, Sprincy doesn't know how to cook. What? Sprincy is the best cook in the world. You, you don't know what you're talking about. Somebody says a bad word about your wife, you'd be the first to jump up, even though you know it's not true, even though Sprincy could not cook for a horse. Doesn't matter. Sprincy is the best cook in the world. Her husband's a chazan. The guy has such a bad voice, every window in the world cries, they have to get shatterproof glass in the, sh- glass in the shul. No. My husband is a chazan like Kusevitsky. My husband is a chazan like Yosel Rosenblatt. Her husband's a rabbi. He begins every time he talks, the oilam is far shlufin and like a coma. No, my husband is the most dynamic speaker in New York. It doesn't matter. That's loyalty. Even though it's Shekhar v'chazav. The husband and wife will jump through fire and water to stick up for each other, to be loyal to each other, to help each other. You say... Your house is a wreck. Your house is flying. My wife keeps the cleanest house in the neighborhood. My wife is the best balabusta. The guy, the guy is a wreck. 
The guy is a shlamazel and a shlamiel. No, my husband is a prince. That's the midah of loyalty. It has, it has nothing to do with romance. It has nothing to do with love. When you stood under the chuppah and you committed harei ad mikudesh asli, you committed vidavak b'ishtai. You committed to be loyal to each other. You committed that in this world you're going to plow together the hard ground of Olam Hazeh. You're going to make a living together. You're going to raise your children together. You're going to be together in health, chas v'shalom in illness. You're going to walk your children down to the chuppah. You're going to lie side by side in the ground, la'achamei v'asem shana, and ha'nehavim b'chayeyem uv'maysam le'nefrado. You're going to be together in Olam Haba. That is the fifth principle in marriage, the principle of nemonos, the principle of loyalty. Marva b'isai, the sixth commandment of marriage is don't pay attention to words. Don't pay attention to nasty words. You know, sometimes the stress levels get very high. Sometimes, you know, it's a pressure cooker in the house. And one spouse is going to say something nasty to the other. How do you react? No, not don't take it to heart. You didn't hear anything. She didn't mean it, and you didn't hear it. Not that you forgot about it. It didn't even enter your, your ear. You have to realize that don't take words to heart. They don't mean anything. People are very uh, nervous. People are under tremendous pressure. The husband says, what? She belittled me. She doesn't respect me. No, what do you want for her? He's going to have a nervous breakdown. Don't pay attention to any words that are said. It's ke'ilu, nothing was said. You didn't hear anything. The Gemara says like this. The Gemara says a great cloud. The Gemara says in Sanhedrin Dav Zayin, says the Gemara, Tuvya deshama ve'idish chalfuha bishte mea. Tuvya, lucky. Deshama is a man who hears ve'idish and is silent. A man who could hear a bad word about him. You're a slob. You don't do anything good. You never help. A man who could hear a nasty word and not say anything is a lucky man. Says the Gemara, Chalfuha Bishte Mea. A hundred evils will pass by him. He spares himself from a hundred evils. Person thinks, What? How could they say that about me? You're a fool! You shouldn't have heard anything. Nothing was said. Don't pay attention. But it's my wife. That's how she. Doesn't matter who it is. Don't pay attention to words that are said to you. They're not meant anything. Otherwise, you're going to, have to say something back to her. It's going to downward spiral. She's going to get upset. You're going to cut her off. She's going to get insulted. And then says um, Rev Miller, so many times couples come to him and the woman's complaining, there's no shalom bias, there's no shalom bias. So Rav Miller says, you know, what's the problem? Does the guy, the guy works? Yeah. But does he gamble? No. Does he beat you? No. He's shamer to Yeah. So what's the problem? Words. Most marital strife comes from words. And the sixth commandment of marriage is do not pay attention to any words. They don't mean it. They didn't say it. Make believe like, you know, remember there was a fish in Williamsburg? And there was a, supposedly, yeah. there was a dibuk and they had a call in the Kobalim. I, I'm sure it never happened, but they say it happened, right? So you want to believe, you don't believe it. Anything that's said to you, just imagine there's a dibuk that came, went into somebody's body, and said to you X, Y, and Z. If it was a fish, you're gonna, what are you going to do? You're going to strangle the fish? It doesn't matter who it is. Don't pay attention to anything that anybody says. Learn to have thick skin, learn to have slippery skin, and just don't pay attention. Rav Miller says, remember the case? 19-year-old kid, it was Tubishvat. Famous trial in New York. He takes a group of boys from Yeshiva University. They go to Madison Square Garden. And they're headed into the uh, stadium. That was the first mistake. Well, who are they going to watch already? You know, the Rangers? I mean, come on. Right? But anyway, they're about to go into MSG. And some goyim say, you know, mock the guy's yarmulke. So the guy's a fool. What are you doing, you know, goyim say to you an insulting thing? You run away as fast as you can. But the guy thought, the worst thing you could do, you know, people think, I'm going to teach my kid karate so he could defend himself. The mo, yeah. Do you think the guy's gun will be less, you know, impactful when, because you're, you're a little Jewish kid with a yellow belt knows karate? So the Jew, 
the Chacham from the Manashtana, what does he do? He takes out a pair of nunchucks. Shaita Shabaylam. So the guy goes to his car, takes out a hammer, and busts the kid's brain open. It's a famous case in New York. So what happens? It comes to trial in Queens, Supreme Queens. Gentile judge. Gentile judge says, eh, this is not murder, this is a criminal negligence. And, and she says, you know what? The courtroom is not a place for vengeance. That, that, then where is exactly? She pushes off the case for a year and a half. Meanwhile, the murderer got five years probation. So once a month, he goes into the police office. He says, hey, Mike! He signs in his name, and then he goes back, and he pulls out the hammer again and does it again. That's what the punishment was. But if this Jew would have learned the Gemara and Sanhedrin that says, Tuvya de Shama Ve'idosh, lucky is a man who hears something and is silent, then when that guy said, hey Jew boy, what would he have done? He would have gone straight into Madison Square Garden to watch the Rangers lose. And he, he wouldn't have even paid attention. So that's the sixth principle. The sixth principle of marriage is, Tuvya de Shama Ve'idosh, lucky is a man who hears words and is silent. Do not pay attention to anything that anybody says to you. It's not their fault. It's temporary insanity. They're angry. They're upset. It's a long day. The kids drove them crazy. You drive them crazy. Whatever it is, don't pay attention to anything that people say to you, even your wife. Unless she needs money, then just give it to her. The seventh principle in marriage. The seventh principle in marriage is... Also, what you can never, ever say. Never say this. One spouse should never say to the other, I hate you. I hate you. You're angry. You're upset. It's getting to a boiling point. Never say, I hate you. Because once you say those words, then the mystique and the magic of Hareya Mekudash Asli, it's already been broken. Even to say, I don't like you. Just keep your mouth shut. Go back into the backyard, bang your head again against the wall 70 times, punch the punching man. Never say the words, I don't like you. And now let's talk to men now. Very important. Never tell your wife you look ugly. I don't like how you look. Oh, that's a, that's a no-no. You're a Russia. Don't say that to your wife. It, it's a dagger in her heart. You're killing her. You're killing her. Rav Miller says people used to, he said, even if your wife is 95 years old and she has one foot in the grave and she's toothless and she's full of wrinkles, she's going to be looking in the mirror, she's going to say, Honey, do you think I have more wrinkles today? So if you want to get Olam Haba, you say, Dear, you look more beautiful today than the day that I married you. You say that, Yeshucha Chela Gadol Ba'olam Haba. Even a woman, Rav Miller says, that she has one foot in the grave. She's looking in the mirror. She wants to, she wants to look nice. She wants to look beautiful. Rav, Rav Miller says people used to come to him, a woman used to come to him and say, you know, my husband tells me that um, the women in the street look better than you. Shaita, how, how could you say that to your wife? You know, that, that, your wife, when she walks in the street, that's what they say about her. So a person has to be very careful. You see, marriage is based on the attraction between the husband and the wife. But you get older, and the attraction dissipates, and sometimes isn't there anymore. You have to live your whole life with the illusion that they look the exact same way as the day you marry them. But you say, but it's artificial. Yeah, that's Avoid Hashem. Avoid Hashem is, you train your mind, train yourself, talk yourself into auto-suggestion you, that... Your wife, the husband and wife, should be noyheg together, should be together as if they're still on their honeymoon, and this way they'll live b'shalim until Admei Vesem Shana. Okay, Marva Aboisai, commandment number eight. The eighth commandment of marriage is as follows. There's a pasuk in the Torah that says, You should love your friend like yourself. So everybody says, who's that going on? Yeah, I'm a Hasidic Shagai. I need to love the guy with the kippah suga like myself. I wear a kippah suga. I need to, lo- to love that guy with the beaver hat like myself. No, what are you talking about? Let me tell you what the Ahavta Recha Kamoich is talking about. The Ahavta Recha Kamoich is talking about your wife. She's Jewish, no? She's a Yid, we hope. 
The Ahavta Larecha Kamaycha is talking about your wife. The Gemara says, you're not allowed to get married until you see your wife. Why? Because if you get married and you don't know what she looks like, maybe you'll see her, you're not going to like the way she looks, and you're going to violate the Ahavta Larecha Kamaycha. Which means that primarily the mitzvah of loving a Jew refers to your wife. And the Avera of hating a Jew refers to your wife. But says Rabbeinu Yoyin, a very important idea. And as Rabbeinu Yoyin says, you know, we have, we have very strict Averas in the Torah. Chilo Shabbos, Chayave Krisais. These are very strict. Murder, Avodah Zara, Gile Arayas. But if you take even a minor sin, let's say you have a guy, he's a lazy guy, and on Shabbos he comes to Shul, and this week this man Kriya is 829 is the Gura, and one's a Magin Avram. What does it say over there? Magin Avram is... 9.05. So the guy rolls into Shul, 9.07. He misses Man Kriya Shema. He's Mavato Mitzvah Sasei Dei Raisa. It's like he didn't wear tefillin that day. Let's say he did it five weeks, ten weeks. He did it a whole year. Says Rabbi Yoyna, it's like he killed somebody. Because if you take a minor Avera and you repeat it again and again and again and again, each thread maybe you could snap and you could rip. But you double it, you triple it, you quadruple it. It turns into a rope which is unbreakable. Even a small minor of error, if it's repeated again and again and again and again, it's even worse than a... So you could have two people. You could have a guy who's a murderer and a guy who misses Kriyashma every Shabbos. The guy who misses Kriyashma every Shabbos, likely the Hitzdarfus and the combination of all his Averos could be worse. It's the same thing with a mitzvah. One guy gave a thousand dollars to tzedakah. And one guy, for three years straight, when Anani came in, he gave a dollar, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar. Who's greater? Who's bigger? Who did a bigger mitzvah? The guy who gave a thousand dollars? Or a guy who gave a thousand times to a thousand different Anim one dollar? So it says in Perkei Avais, Hakol lefi roiv It's not quality, it's quantity. It's repetition. Because the Rambam says, the more you repeat a mitzvah, you're kind of a good practice, you're kind of a good midah. The more you repeat an Avera, then the Avera becomes part of your personality. Says Rav Vigdor Mil Zechitzak Levracha. V'yahavto l'recha kamoicha is a central theme in Kala Torah Kula. And it refers primarily to your wife. So that means, if you have ill will to your wife, and every time you come into the house, you're angry, and you think to yourself, oh, what a Rashanta, and you're, at, you're upset, and you have bad feelings to her, Shachris, Mincha, Marav, day after day after day. Just think about how many Loisisna, Esachicha, Bilvavach you're violating on an hourly basis, on a daily basis. Lachamea Vesrim Shana, the person is in very big trouble. However, a person has to make up their mind that no matter what, they love their spouse. And you walk into the house, before you open that door, you'll be very wise. Prepare yourself mentally. You walk into your house thinking, I love my wife. In the morning, in the evening, at night, three times a day, every day, a thousand times a year. Then you go up to Shamayim and you're rewarded as a tzaddik yisoyed oilam. Why? Because this is the great principle. A person thinks, you know, if a, per- a person could be a big guy in the shul, he could stand at the bima, he could stand at the podium, and everyone thinks he's a holy guy, and everyone thinks he's a tzaddik, he must be very important. Every, you know, he's uh, doing things for the tzibor. If he's uh, rotten at home, if he's uh, a tyrant at home, then he's in big trouble. Primarily, a person will be judged based on what he does most often. And the greatest interaction and the most frequent interaction that a person has in this world is with one's spouse. And therefore, a person has to think that no matter what, I'm committed to be mekayim, this great mitzvah, toward my wife, Yohavta Kamoicha. Shprinzi, could you please pass the oranges? Don't command don't shout, don't demand, better yet, you're not a cripple, get up and get the orange juice yourself. Why does Sprintzy have to get it for you? Well, why, why is the husband sitting there on the table offering commands like he's King Henry VIII? Get off the chair. If you're 99 years old and you're half senile, then maybe 
then Shpinsky could get it for you. Otherwise, get up yourself, get the orange juice yourself, get the food yourself, and, but, if you need somebody to do it for you, please. She asked him, can I, have, can I please have money for the kids to buy shoes? She doesn't have to say please. You already committed yourself. You wrote her a ksuba that you're going to support the family. But she says please. You know, she's lubricating the relationship. And he gives it to her. She says thank you. That's, just, that's part of the politeness and a result of the ninth principle. The ninth principle is the ahafta l'recha kamaycha. Principle number nine. Ready, Israel? For principle number nine? Principle number nine. Metzias chayin. And this is primarily for women, but it applies for men as well. And that is, look good. Don't think, yeah, we're already married. She knows me already. And I could look like a slob. I could walk around like a, a couch potato, like a, a shikar, like a... No. You gotta look good. Your relationship is very much affected by your outer appearance. Especially for women, but for men as well. You can't let it down. Don't look sloppy. Don't look slovenly. Make sure you smell good. Yeah, it's okay, nobody cares. Yeah, they care. They care. I'm embarrassed to say it, but you have to say it. The outer appearance and the way a person presents themselves is very... Um, <coughs> is a very critical factor in the relationship. And therefore, the ninth principle is make sure your outer appearances are proper and that will uh, be an important key in the success of the marriage. And finally, ingredient number ten, the tenth commandment of marriage is don't be a tyrant. Don't be a tyrant. Sometimes, you know, you're married a few years, you're going to sit back on the couch you're going to demand, you're going to order, you're going to, you know, you know the joke, the guy comes into the house and he says, you know who's going to bring me my slippers the moment I walk into the, in the house. And she's looking at him. And you know, when I sit down on the table, who's going to bring me a cold glass of water? And you know, when I sit down, who's going to make me my favorite supper? And you know, well, after I'm done supper, who's going to turn on the bath? And she says, yeah, the Chevra Kadisha. Okay. Anyway, don't be, don't be a tyrant. Don't be a tyrant. Don't be a dictator. Now I'm going to tell you something very important. Marriage is not a 50-50 partnership. In the world, they like you to think, husband and wife, it's a 50-50 partnership. It's not a 50-50. The husband, the man, is the captain of the house. Um, what can I, t- I can only tell you, that's tar that I heard from the But the woman is the first mate. But if you don't treat the first mate with respect, what do you have? If you're going to stamp a tra- trample on the first mate, you got mutiny. So you have to understand that the husband is the captain, the wife is the first mate, but they're both steering the ship together. And they both have to be on board. And if they both um, are noyig to each other with the proper respect and the proper kavod and the proper regard, then the ship will sail to the ultimate goal, and that is... These are the Ten Commandments of Marriage. I will review them quickly in the end. I'm just going to share with you a few details, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, just a few important things. What could a person do to ensure the security of their marriage? Jeff Miller would always recommend that when you get married, and it's never too late, you can be married five years, ten years, fifty years, a hundred years, and that is you need to belong to a kahila, and you need to have a rav. Now, not everybody. There are actually normal people in this world who know how to interact with each other, but there are very few. And therefore, if a person say, Hey, pal, where do you daven? Well, Friday night I daven here. And Shabbos this morning I daven there. And Shabbos Shul, so I go there. Uh, who's your Rav? I ask him, Who's your Rav? A rav, a rav, a going. You know, where does he live? Bar Park. He lives there now? No, 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 he's dead now. So it's very convenient, Rabbi, I say, to have a dead Rav. It's very, it works out very well. Why? Because you, know, you already know the answers to everything and nobody could contradict whatever you say. You're rough. Who's your Rebbe? Rav Nachman of Breslov. That's great. You could go to Uman. But when you have trouble in your marriage, Rav Nachman's not going to come to be Masader between you and your wife. You have to have a Rav that's alive, that knows you, and that your wife knows. People like to ask, it's important that a couple 
have a Rav that they both respect and they can both go to, and they belong to a Kehila. Why? The vast majority of divorces are avoided because people are afraid. Ma yoimru, my guy, the guy sitting next to me in shul. What's what's the what's the rav gonna say? What's my neighbor gonna say? What's the, what what's the shul gonna say? But a guy who's a floater, he doesn't have any shul. Where do you, where do you dive? Who's your rosh Shiva? Rosh Shiva was the rambam. It's not gonna really help in your marriage if the rambam is your. Who's your rosh Shiva? Rab Shimon Shkap. It's very nice that you have the Grudna Mahalach in learning. Abra Lamaisa, if you haven't spoken to your Rosh Hashiva in, in 20 years, there's very little that your Rosh Hashiva is going to be able to do for your family. You need to have a Rav, a Rebbe, a Rosh Hashiva that actually you talk to, that knows your family. And in the back of your Rav Miller and his shul used to sell something called marriage insurance. I don't believe in Rav, Me- in Rav Miller's second Kehillah there were divorces or any divorces. Marriage insurance simply means he would make it his business that the couple get to know the Rav. Why? In most cases, what keeps people together is they're embarrassed of the tzibor. Okay? That's the first thing. The second thing, and we'll make two more points and then we'll wrap it up. Second thing is, there is a false illusion in the world. <coughs> people make a mistake. Ah, oh, my husband! My husband is my best friend. No, he's not. My wife? My wife's my best friend. No doesn't have to be. You know, in marriage you need transparency. We have to be comfortable divulging everything. Yeah, that's if you want to have a bad marriage. It is not necessary to say everything. You do not have to say in third grade, I flunked math, or I'm not good in math. It's not necessary to tell your wife that you have fungus under your toenails. She doesn't have to know that. Why does she have to know that for? She should think that you smell like roses. He should think she smells like roses. It is absolutely never a good idea to divulge any information about yourself that is compromising what she thinks of you. You don't have to say that you weren't good in anything. You don't have to say, do not say anything that reflects badly upon yourself. It is okay if she thinks you're perfect because she, she'll know very well that you're not. It is not necessary for you to confirm anything in her mind. Any information that reflects badly on you, never divulge it. So Miller says, uh, you know, but, but, but you're not being sincere with me. This is not about sincerity. This is about getting through life. The, it's a Mishnah Perkei Al Tarba Sicha Im Ha'isha. Be'ishtoi Amru. And the Avais Rav Nasan, it speaks out that it is absolutely not a good idea to divulge all information. Yes, if you went to shul, and you asked a good kasha, and the Rebbe said, you're a goin oilam, go tell your wife. The Rebbe said, I'm the next Rebbe Kiva Eger. But if you were somewhere on the street, and somebody said, you're a shaita shaba oilam, it's not necessary to tell that to your wife, because the next time it comes up, she's going to use it against you. So it's working against yourself. Not necessary to say anything that reflects badly on you. And finally, by the way, any information that you heard tonight that you don't think it will go over well at home, you don't have to say either. This is just between me and you, okay? As close friends, I'm telling you what's important for you to hear. But again, you know, tamachacham v'yachamam. Finally, a very important part of marriage. Again, this is not a matter of love. This is not a matter of romance. It's a matter of loyalty. Is kind words. Husband comes home. He woke up early to dive in to get the kids off. He worked the whole day. The boss is annoying. The boss is arrogant. The boss busted his chops. He comes home from the subway. He's mamish like a shmata. And um, well, the woman says, what's wrong? And he says, the boss said I don't do anything right. Huh, I guess me and the boss have something in common, right? So it's a, a tremendous chilek of a marriage and loyalty is to use kind words. In this instance, she poured salt on his wounds. She would be smart. She would comfort him. She would say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You're the best father, you're the best husband. And obviously, the other way around. He comes home, you know, he's sitting at work drinking coffee all day. He's, uh, you know, on, on, on the web instead of working. He's sitting on the subway reading the paper for two hours. After having a vacation for 14 hours, he comes home to her. She's chalishing away. She's cooking. The kids are driving her up the wall. 
and he, co- he comes home to a mess, and it's a very big Nisan, it's a very big test. And his mitzvah is, this is not a matter of love, not a matter of romance, it's a matter of loyalty, commitment. You committed to be interested in her welfare. You say you had a hard day, I don't know how you keep it together. It's amazing how you run this house. You're doing a tremendous mitzvah, and you're fulfilling your, your responsibility as a husband. So we hope that um, we could be Mekayim. Some of these Ten Commandments, we'll just review very quickly. The Ten Commandments of marriage, number one, be realistic. Don't have high expectations. Number two, never break the routine of the marriage. Number three, make up as soon as possible. Number four, never say the word get. Number five, loyalty. Number six, don't pay attention to words that are said to you. Number seven, never say, I hate you. Number eight, the mitzvah, the ahavta l'reacha kamoicha, applies primarily to one's spouse. Number nine, you have to make sure to look good. And finally, number ten, don't be a tyrant. We hope Hashem gives us the seichel and the common sense to guide our homes and our marriages in the proper way. We're able to preserve the Kedusha that it started with when we said those words, Hareya Mekudash Asli, we should all be Zoycha, Ish Isha, Shalom Beneyam, Shechina Beneyam, we should be Zoycha, to bring the presence of Hashem into our homes. And we should see tremendous Nachas from our families. Thank you everyone for coming. Have a wonderful night. Shkayach. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.